Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2012 Opportunity Nations Summit. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Chris Hill, and it is an absolute pleasure to be here. I'm thrilled, I'm delighted, and I'm more than honored to be speaking before you today. You know, this event, it's about us all coming together to move our nation forward. It's about a concept that no individual should be left behind, that every single person, should they be willing to grasp it, should have access to opportunity. A little background on me. I was raised in the San Francisco area by both my mother and father, but in two separate homes, because the one that was held originally had been broken. You see, they divorced when I was six years old, and as time passed, it seemed as though my own spirits had been left broken in the way that their marriage was. I remember moving around a lot with my mother, sometimes having to stay in the rough neighborhoods. I remember my exposure to the violence and the gunshots, but worst of all, the negative influences. I think as time passed, I, I found my self-conforming to the attitudes of those around me. I didn't really care about school, my future, or pretty much anything that looked beyond the moment at hand. Up through high school, I had a similar attitude. I, I wasn't motivated about school. I wasn't motivated about excelling and going to higher places, and essentially, all I was really trying to do was get by. Well, having that attitude in high school actually led me to have an interaction with my principal that wasn't a positive one. You know, one day, there I am, I'm, you know, strolling down the, the hallway. I got my hat on, my matching outfit, feeling good, looking great. And he asked me to take off my hat. Now, I take it off, I walk down a little bit further. I, quick, I pull a quick double check, look back over the shoulders maneuver. I see he's not looking, I pop it right back on and keep on walking. I think I'm being slick. Of course, he catches me and lets me have it a little bit, and there ends up being some conflict and later some confrontation between him and my mother. So it starts out a little bit ugly. But I believe that as time passed, he saw that I was a good young man at heart, that I had good values, that I was a good person. You know, inside I had all of the hurt and pain from wanting my family to get back together. I had my own insecurities. I wasn't confident about my looks, my capabilities, or pretty much anything else. But I was a good young man at heart. Well, for that, that reason, one day, he referred me to this youth administrative program called Summer Search, which was about creating opportunity. The initial offer was for two free trips, an induction into a community, and a lifelong support system. But I think that as I completed the process, I ended up gaining more than I could have ever bargained for. That experience became a huge part of my life. Just the process of getting to know different people and going to places that I never could have even imagined helped me to change my thinking and open my eyes to the fact that I could change my attitude, that everything was within my grasp, that all I needed to do was set my mind towards achieving it. And it was mine to have and mine to hold. That concept. That experience helped me to change the way that I thought about things. And I stand before you now as the man that I am today because of that investment process. I stand before you now a better young man because of that transformation. Currently, I'm a senior at the University of San Francisco majoring in business with a focus in finance and a minor in economics. With a 3.9 GPA, a degree right around the corner and in a... <laughs> and an unprecedented surge 
of motivation. I want to move forward. That's where I'm going. You know, my first paying job was at an investment company called Hall Capital, in which I did portfolio management and learned a great deal about investment. This summer, I had the privilege of doing a finance internship with Gap, in which I rotated into several different areas of finance within Gap, and I worked on several different projects within those areas, areas such as Banana Republic real estate and FP&A, Treasury, et cetera. And you know, when I get that paycheck, it feels exceptional. You know, after all, I am a starving student, I need the money, but <laughs> beyond that, it's not so much the paycheck itself. It's really getting up and every day coming to work, dressing and feeling professional, doing something important, something relevant. That's really the heart of it. I now pay taxes, and I am a part of this country's economic recovery. <laughs> I am now an asset and no longer a liability. And because of that, I'm, I'm so motivated to make a difference. I'm motivated to help other people. With my life, I want to do something important something relevant. I want to come up a little bit higher. And along the way, I want to help other people come up a little bit higher. That's the vision. That's my dream. That's the opportunity. And because I've been given a chance and an opportunity, I know that one day I can achieve it. Today, I'm so excited to be a part of this event, for the chance we have to unite as one, and for the chance we have here and now to invest in the future of our great nation. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that story. It's my pleasure. Thank you for sharing that story. My pleasure. So Chris, thank you. Tell us, tell us what are you up to next? What's, what's the future hold? Well, I graduate in May, and I'm currently looking at opportunities in finance, and I'm currently in the process of talking to Gap and Hall Capital, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Fantastic, fantastic. Are there any young people in this room who just want the chance to succeed, like Chris here? Any young people here? <laughs> any young people who just want a chance to show the world what you can do? Imagine how much better off our country would be if we created sturdy ladders of opportunity so that all young adults in this room had a chance to achieve their full potential. Thank you, Chris Hill. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the 2012 Opportunity Nation Summit. My name is Mark Edwards, the Executive Director of Opportunity Nation. Thank you for coming and helping us activate our shared plan to build strong pathways to school and career so that all young adults in this country have a chance to get into the economic game. But let's face it, we're also here because the American dream needs a jump start. You know this because you experience it every day. Economic mobility, that core idea of America, that idea that's part of our exceptionalism that says no matter who you are, if you work hard, you should be able to do well, is slowing. There's increasing stickiness at both ends of the economic spectrum, right? Where you start in life increasingly determines where you end up. Or as a young woman in Las Cruces, New Mexico told me last year, it feels like the numbers in my zip code are determining my future more than the numbers in my GPA. This makes me incredibly angry because at the same time, the education gap in this country is growing. Young adults don't have the skills to match today's jobs. Youth unemployment is at an all-time high. And in the recent job report for August, you probably saw those buried in those numbers, was the fact that there were 453,000 fewer young adults employed in August than there were in July. Those are seasonally adjusted numbers. And in low-income communities, 
only one out of 10 high school freshmen achieves post-secondary training and success by the age of 24. One out of 10. Think about the talent we are leaving on the sidelines. So an education gap has become a skills gap, which has become an opportunity gap. Everyone here is focused on closing the opportunity gap. We may do so from different perspectives, from different points of view. We may sort of tackle the, 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 the lifeline at different points, but the, fa the fact is that we are all focused on the opportunity gap. In this room, there are 250 organizations that work with or touch 100 million Americans. Think about how much we could get done if we could align our vision. There are decades and decades of hard work and success in this room, real solutions, and we honor that. And at the same time, we are standing on the shoulders of giants before us. Think about the times we've come together as a country to make transformative leaps in opportunity. A generation expanded the vote for women in this country. A generation passed the GI Bill. A generation created the Civil Rights Movement. We must be the generation to close the opportunity gap. And in your hands right now, you have a plan to do that. A plan to do that for young adults in this country. This is your plan. These are your ideas. It came from conversations with young adults all around the country about the barriers they're facing in communities. Many, many meetings with our coalition who helped us figure out what's actually working on the ground. Lots of meetings on the Hill with Democrats and Republicans and a continued dialogue with this really unusual policy, frame, policy group that's worked with us, with people from the Heritage Foundation, Center for American Progress, and Brookings. Three groups that don't spend a whole lot of time together. But I think with this opportunity frame, they're willing to come together around some shared ideas that'll actually make a difference. And today, we're gonna activate this plan. So quick preview on today. First, we're gonna hear from some, from some incredible scholars about the state of the American dream and opportunity, what that looks like. We're then gonna do a deep dive into what's going on with young adults, why we all need to care about this, and why it's important for the future of our country. But the bulk of today is about solutions and activating our plan, figuring out how we can make this plan real in local communities. There's plenty of work our legislators can do, but there's lots of work that we can do. And we're not gonna leave here without commitments from everybody, everyone in this room has a role to play in making this plan real. We really believe that this is the moment to come together around some shared ideas so we can make sure that this next generation of extraordinary leaders has a chance to achieve their American dream. We can do this, let's get to work. Thank you for being here. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the president of George Washington University, our host, Dr. Stephen Knapp. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Chris, for that inspiring opening. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm delighted to welcome you to the George Washington University and to the historic Lisner Auditorium. It's truly an honor to co-host this year's Opportunity Nation Summit. You know, I think one thing everyone can agree on across the spectrum of political opinion is that closing the opportunity gap that uh, Mark just described is not only vital to our nation's economic success, but to our health as a democratic society. Opening opportunities for success is the best way to reduce the disparities in health and wealth that have increasingly become worrying features of American society. The future of opportunity in our nation very much depends upon the solutions that people like our speakers and panelists are already working on. I hope the conversations you have today will enrich your abilities to design effective strategies for increasing opportunity. At George Washington, our faculty is also helping to close the opportunity gap through research and teaching. Just a few examples, faculty in our Graduate School of Education and Human Development are focusing on school reform and access to higher education. Our law school's Small Business and Community Economic Development Clinic provides free startup legal advice for businesses and nonprofit organizations. Dean Doug Guthrie 
of our School of Business and his MBA students are working closely with the Mayor's Office to create a business plan for the District of Columbia's economic development. And that will open opportunities for citizens both within the district and across the whole capital region. Again, closing the opportunity gap is not only essential to our nation's economic success, but to our well-being as a thriving democracy. We look forward to hearing from the many distinguished guests who will be part of today's summit, and we're excited to explore the ways in which GW can continue being part of the solution. Please enjoy the program. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Washington Post journalist Michael Gerson and Harvard University's Dr. Robert D. Putnam. Well, thanks for coming to this summit. My job is to try to lay out why there's a problem here with respect to opportunity. There's been a lot of conversation this election season about equality, most of it focused on what you might call equality of outcome, that is, equality within the current generation, people having more money or less money within the current generation. Americans have historically not worried a whole lot about disparities of income. We don't typically mind if they're really rich people. We don't care how high the ladder is because we assume everybody's getting on the ladder at about the same point, and then some people will climb faster or be better climbers, work harder, and get up higher on the ladder. But that all assumes that we're all getting on the ladder at about the same point. That we do care about, and that is the problem that America is now facing. We're not getting on, we're, not, we're nowhere near getting on the ladder at the same point. There's been, indeed, a shocking change in American, in the lives of American young people over the last 30 years that portend a significant, sharp drop in social mobility and the opportunities for advancement for kids coming from the less well-off part of the population. We are facing an opportunity cliff in the next couple of years in which uh, social mobility, up the chances of social mobility from the lower part of the population decline sharply. It's not going to happen quite as quickly as the fiscal cliff that everybody talks about next January, but it's going to be much more damaging to the long-run future of our society. Let me say a little bit about the evidence that leads me to this pretty dire perspective on the chances for equality of opportunity going forward. First of all, over the last 30 or 40 years, there have been a series of growing gaps between our kids coming from upper middle class backgrounds, kids coming from college educated backgrounds, basically the upper third of American society, and kids coming from less well off backgrounds, the lower third of American society, the roughly speaking kids coming from homes where nobody's gone past high school in terms of their education level. 30 years ago, there was not much of a gap in test scores between kids coming from those two uh, different sorts of backgrounds. But over the last 30 years, there's been a sharply increasing gap in test scores between kids coming from uh, well-off backgrounds and kids coming from the lower third of the population. But it's not just test scores. There's been a significant change in the amount of time that parents spend with their own children, what we in my research project call good night moon time. Um, middle, middle class parents are spending a lot more time with their kids than they used to, and working class parents are spending not a lot more time than they used to with their kids. So there's now an average of an hour gap in parental time every day between a kid coming from a, a college educated family and a kid coming from a less, a less well educated family. But it's not just time with kids, it's not just investments of time. Middle class kids are, middle class parents are investing a lot more money in their kids, about $5,000 a year over the last 20 or 30 years, $5,000 a year in, uh, in spending on their, on, for development of their kids, going to summer camp and, and that sort of thing. Um, the same, in constant dollars, there's been about a $500, a dollar, less than a $500 increase in the spending of families that are less well off. But it's not just inside the family. S take, taking part in all sorts of extracurricular activities, you see the same growing gap. Middle class kids, kids coming from college, educa from college educated backgrounds, are much more likely to be in band and chorus and football and French club and so on, much more likely. And working class kids over that same period have become much less likely to be involved in band and chorus and even, even athletics. 
Or how about community organizations like taking part in the Scouts or, or volunteering for other community organizations? Up for middle class kids, down for working class kids. Um, or how about going to church? Up for middle class kids, way down for working class kids. Um, how about uh, just trusting your environment, trusting people that you're around? Up or steady for middle class kids, but way down for working class kids. Well, why not? Every institution in society is increasingly failing those working class kids. Family, community, church, schools. And, all, and the, this is the worst part of it. All of the things that I've just mentioned predict success in life. Going to church, being involved in community organizations, uh, getting high test scores, uh, spending time with mom and dad, all of those things in, are increasingly concentrated among kids coming from one part of our society. And what that means is, and this is the sharpest way to put this point, increasingly going forward over the next 20 or 30 years in America, how well you do in life will depend upon one decision you make, choosing your parents. If you're, <laughs> if you're smart and alert when parents are being chosen and you pick college educated parents, you're set for life. But if you're asleep on the day when parents are chosen, or you know, you don't, you kind of blow it off and say, I don't care, I'll take whatever you got there, and you end up with a high school educated parent, your goose is cooked and you haven't even done a thing. Now, there are two reasons why that's a problem. First of all, it just isn't fair. It's not fair to have your, your life chances be dependent upon how you, how you did in the parental lottery. And secondly, it's, at, it's dumb from a national standpoint because we cannot write off one third of our whole population uh, and still expect to be internationally competitive. How did this happen? It's a, it, this is a purple problem. This is a problem, some of whose causes you see most clearly through red conservative lenses. It has to do with the breakdown of the working class, the white working class family. By the way, I should say, I've been talking about class all the time, and I hope you are not translating that directly into race. Race is related, but the changes I'm talking about are not about race, they're about class. They are show up in all races of America, this growing gap that I've been talking about. Part of it, as I say, the causes are seen most clearly through a red conservative lens. Part of them, the causes are seen most clearly through a blue lens, and that's the collapse of the, of the working wage economy for working class Americans. And part of it has to do with changes in the, in the neighborhoods and communities. I think the most important underlying cause, however, is this. When I was growing up, when parents in my hometown, small town in Ohio, talked about our kids, they used the phrase our kids, they meant all of the kids in the community. Our kids were the kids in town. Now when we talk about our kids, we mean my kids, my biological kids. Over the last 30 years, there's been a shrinkage of whose kids we're worried about. And we don't worry about, you know, the kids of those, those other people down the block who are, who are, who are they're, they're less well off. The parents in, these, in some of these working class families may not be entirely uh, admirable people, but the kids didn't cause the problem. And it, they're our kids too. So I think this is a huge challenge for America going forward. Michael? First of all, before I have any reaction, let me say what a real honor it is to be not just with you, um, but to be with one of the scholars of broad influence and deep humanity on these issues. So I, I really appreciate being with Bob. Um, the good news in this election, as you mentioned, is we are having a sort of debate on opportunity. The bad news is how unbelievably and distressingly shallow it is. Um, you know, we've heard talk of makers and takers and the 47% and the lazy language of libertarianism. Um, and we've also hear some of the easy language of egalitarianism in, 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 these, uh, in these debates. I, people, I think, are genuinely disturbed about something being lost. You see it in the Tea Party where they think it's government oppression causing this. You see it in Occupy Wall Street where it's more a small group of economic elites that are causing fundamental changes in American society. But the anxiety is very real. Um, the problem is that we don't have a political debate that's sufficient uh, to that uh, deep provocation. 
Um, while I, I've been involved, I spend my days looking at political life. Um, I was looking at your um, research, uh, some of which took place in your hometown, I think, in Ohio, um, Port Cl Clinton, um, where one of your interviewers uh, talked to a real woman with a fictitious name of Mary Sue, um, whose parents had divorced when she was small, whose mother had taken up stripping and left her for days at a time, whose stepmother beat her um, and confined her to a single room, who uh, was, you know, went to juvenile detention uh, for, for selling pot, who had boyfriend, a boyfriend who burned her arms with cigarettes. Um, and uh, she told the story of being in that apartment and her friend being a yellow mouse her only contact. Um, and it was a story that when you look at the qu poor quality of our public debate and you look at the reality, the human reality um, of so many people in America, it, asked, it raises the question, um, what does opportunity really mean in a circumstance like that? And why is our political debate not capable of dealing uh, with the human reality? Um, now, I would give several reasons, and I don't want to take too much time. One of them is that we have a political system that's focused on the middle class. You hear that among Democrats and Republicans. Political advisors tell you that's where the votes are. It's a strange inversion of the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are the middle class, for they shall receive the biggest tax reductions. Um, <laughs> and I, but there's also an ideological problem here. Um, where you have uh, a, a situation where Republicans, I think, have adopted a kind of basic libertarian approach. Um, and because they lack a language to talk about, uh, about this. Um, and you often have a, a perception that the options, the social options, are between rugged individualism and bureaucratic centralization. And it ignores the fact that opportunity comes from different places. Um, um, you know, one way to put it, it might be, we, are, we own what we build, but as human beings, we're also built, okay? Not only got by government, by ins but by institutions, families and religious congregations and orderly, hopeful neighborhoods um, that shape or extinguish our ambitions and dreams. Um, and in this way, the opportunity gap, the debate on this does have an advantage of sorts. Both liberals and conservatives have something to offer here, as, as you mentioned. Values and family are central to opportunity. So are communities with decent jobs and decent pay. Um, so is our working public schools and higher education. So are stable communities where religious institutions take a really leading role. So is health. So is wealth building and entrepreneurship. Um, eventually, the political class is going to be forced to deal with the opportunity gap because it's worsening and because it's fundamentally inconsistent with the American ideal. Um, the question is whether it, uh, creative people are going to be ready with the ideas that are necessary um, to begin to bridge these problems. And I think that's where Opportunity Nation comes in and, and others. Um, this is not the best political time to, to debate these issues, but the time will come. And the question is whether the policy community will be prepared um, for the necessary work to save the American ideal. Um, and so that's why I appreciate what all of you are doing here, and particularly the way that Bob is drawing attention to these issues. So thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Angela Glover Blackwell, founder and CEO, PolicyLink. We're having an important conversation about how to connect young people to schools and to careers. But did you know that over the course of this day, much of which you will sit here, talking about these problems, that 6,000, more than 6,000, 
black and Latino young people will drop out of the nation's public schools. Regarding careers, by 2018, 60% of the American jobs will require at least some college. 45% of those will require an associate's degree. And here's a shocker, perhaps. Three quarters of Latino and black people do not have that degree. Is this a problem? Sure it is. It's a problem for the young people that I'm talking about because we know that their opportunities will be limited, that their futures may not be bright. And it is a problem for the nation, a huge problem for the nation. Let me tell you why. America's tomorrow is going to be very different from America's yesterday. In 1980, in this country, 20% of the population was of color, Latino, Asian, Native American, black, of color. By the 2010 census, 36% of the population was of color. By 2042, not 2050, by 2042, the majority of the people in this nation will be of color. Already, the majority of babies born are of color. By 20, the end of this decade, by the end of this decade, the majority of all people under 18 will be of color. And by 2030, the majority of the young workforce will be of color. If we continue to have communities that are systematically being left behind, if we continue to have communities that do not have access to what they need in order to fully contribute, the future is not bright for the nation. And so what has been a moral concern in this nation for its history, and certainly for me, I've been working on these issues all my adult life because it was the right thing to do, it was the moral thing to do, it was the just thing to do. It continues to be that. But we now are at a point at which we have to make sure that everybody is able to contribute, everybody's able to reach their full potential. It has become imperative for the nation that we get this right. Now, why do I keep talking about race? Why do I keep bringing it up? I actually bring it up all across the country. All too often, I know that people do not want to hear it. Why doesn't she just come out, say something nice, and get off without <laughs> forcing us to talk and think about race? And the reason is because while we know that we have to have universal goals if we're going to achieve the things we need for the nation, Without targeted strategies informed by the realities of people's lives, including those things that are happening in their lives because they're black, Latino, Native American, or other, that we will not be able to have strategies that are going to make a difference. Let me talk about that for a little bit. Class matters for sure. We just heard about that, and I embrace that conversation completely. And race matters. One of the things that we know in this country is that where you live has so much to do with the opportunities that are available to you. If you live in a low-income community, if you live in a low-income community of color, you very likely aren't going to have a school that's going to meet all of your needs. You may well be isolated from jobs. You may not be near public transportation that can connect you to jobs. Housing discrimination against black people continues to be the highest form of housing discrimination in the country. It matters about race when you think about place, because place and race are tied together. We also know that when you are thinking about schools, when you're thinking about how to make sure that children have everything they need, we've had an experiment going on in this country in which middle class families have shown us how to make sure that their children are well educate, educated. They send their kids to a good school. Within that school, they make sure they find a good classroom with a good teacher, but they also make sure that they don't leave it to the school alone. They have extracurricular activities. They make sure the kids are busy in the summer. They have a whole expanded learning that is available. We need to make sure that in low-income communities of color that that's available there as well. When we think about access to higher education, it has to happen. You, I, you heard, 
at least some college is going to be required for 60% of the jobs going forward. We have to make sure that young people are able to really move forward into higher education. That means that they have to do well in K-12. To do well in K-12, they have to begin school ready to learn. So what does that say for all of us? What it says is that we have to pay attention not just to setting the universal goals, but having the targeted strategies to get to the children and the communities in ways that what we know we all need gets to all of us in a way that we can utilize it to build a path going forward. Are we going to be an opportunity nation or are we going to be a pull up the ladder nation? We are here because we believe we can be an opportunity nation, but we have to invest in that ladder. That ladder has to go all the way to the ground, not hover as a distant dream. That ladder has to be strong so it can hold the millions that have to climb up to do what they need for themselves and what the nation needs for them to do. That ladder has to be available. It has to be available to all. So that means we have to do what we're doing now. We have to focus on school. We have to focus on careers. We have to focus on the young people who are ready to lead but we have to make sure that all can lead. You are generous, we are generous as a nation. We are mentors. We give in our faith institutions. We donate. We give of our time. We serve in soup kitchens and that's all good, but it is not enough. We have to do that and we have to do more. We have to do more. We have to make sure that we have more than programs. Head Start programs and other early childhood programs that may be excellent and only reach a few will not do for the future we need. We need a system that makes sure that all children begin school ready to learn. An after school program here and there that's wonderful is not enough. We have to have expanded learning for all children and make sure that they reach their full potential. A good job training program, an excellent community college here or there is not enough. Our whole system has to systematically make sure that all children get what they need. We're at a crucial moment. The things that we hold dear, we have to continue to hold dear. It is a moral imperative for sure, but it's also an economic imperative. We need young people to be all in. And for them to be all in, we have to be all in. By that I mean, we have to make sure that we're giving it all we have so that the young people who we know are going to be our future are ready to be our leaders, they're ready to be our workers, they're ready to be our entrepreneurs, they're ready to keep democracy alive through civic engagement. It's up to us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kerry Sullivan, President, Bank of America Charitable Foundation, and Tariq Muhammad, 2012 Bank of America Student Leader. Well, good morning. It's really great to be here today. There's amazing energy in the room, and we are so glad to be part of it. I want to thank Mark Edwards and his team for organizing this important su summit with so many distinguished participants and leaders. Many of, of our nonprofit partners um, are here today City Year, Year Up, Youth Build, Communities and Schools, to name, to name just a few. I know I've left some folks out, but it's great, and it's great to see so many opportunity youth and young adults who are here to chart their course for success. It's really impressive. Today, we are all rallied around a common goal to give youth and young adults access to the 21st century skills they need to compete, not only in today's job market, but in the future. At Bank of America, we are focused on strengthening local communities and economies. And we believe that helping people find meaningful employment is really the first step in our nation's recovery. We've cast a wide net and have focused our efforts on the chronically underemployed, unemployed veterans and most importantly, youth and young adults. This morning, I'd like to share some of the strategies we've deployed to help the next generation achieve economic success. We recognize that young people have been disproportionately impacted by the recession. With teen employment rates across the country running as high as 25%, and in some communities, much higher. We also know that the dropout rate is reaching an all-time high and that many young people are living in poverty. 
Today, young people face a multitude of challenges that can hinder their ability to connect to the skills and employment opportunities that will give them a chance to be part of our country's economic growth. Whether a young person is dropped out of school or just needs that extra support, such as mentoring, to guide them down the right path, there are many needs that can be addressed and it, need, it will take us to collectively address them. At Bank of America, we've developed a comprehensive workforce development strategy targeted at youth. We focus around three efforts. One, making sure young people have the support and guidance they need to stay in school, graduate from high school, and connect to post-secondary education, whether that be college, community college, or industry credentialing. Two, for those young adults that fall through the cracks, we want to make sure that there is an on-ramp to complete their education and prepare them for meaningful employment and livable wage jobs. And lastly, we are focused on supporting the next generation of leaders. And we have some of our student leaders here today, as well as, as uh, Tariq, by supporting and promoting youth and young adults who can be catalysts for change. This past summer, um, Bank of America helped over a thousand high school students find employment in their local communities through a combination of nonprofit work and opportunities uh, to work at, at the bank. But we recognize that job opportunities are more than just a paycheck. Teens who are employed have lower dropout rates, are more likely to continue their education to pursue long-term career goals, and ultimately show an increase of lifetime earning potential. One unique feature of our strategy is that we're not focused just on training individuals for the financial service industry, per se. We place and train young people in opportunities that, where they can gain skills connect to opportunities that, that exist in their own communities, whether it be healthcare, environment, hospitality, technology, just to name a few. But all of this comes into play through the work with our nonprofit and partners, both national and local, who are tirelessly on the front line doing the, the good work. We also feel that volunteer engagement, particularly mentoring young people, can make an impact. And we do think that supporting students in, the, in their quest for leadership is, is another great strategy. Nine years ago, we established a student leaders program, which annually provides 225 community-minded high school juniors and seniors across the the U.S. with both a leadership training skill, uh, training program, excuse me, and an internship at a local nonprofit. Since 2004, we've recognized nearly 2,000 student leaders in these 44 cities. All of them have worked at a range of nonprofit organizations serving the greater good for the summer. These range from organizations like Boys and Girls Club, Clubs to Habitat for Humanity. Student leaders also attend a week-long leadership summit in D.C. where they look at the intersection of business, nonprofit, and go the government sectors. These are civic-minded students, but we help them become more connected and form a peer network that, which will last much longer than the program. They have demonstrated an interest already, and we're helping them advance further as leaders in their local communities. Their work experience at a nonprofit is, is an important part of the program as they learn valuable life skills from managing a paycheck to developing an understanding of the workplace and the issues facing their community. And student leaders have a ripple effect when they go back to their own communities as peer mentors and leaders. This morning, I'd like to introduce Tariq Mohammed, who is one of our 2012 student leaders. Tariq Mohammed is a student leader we are extremely proud of. He's a recent graduate of John Marshall High School in Richmond, Virginia, and while he has had his share of hardship, his passion to help others in need makes him so impressive, and everyone who meets him is, is totally impressed with the work that he's done. We are so pleased that he could join us today to share some of his thoughts about his experience as a student leader and the importance of connecting young leaders to important work. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Good morning. I'm Tariq, Mo Tariq Mohammed. I grew up in New York City and moved to Richmond, Virginia three years ago with my mom and two sisters. As Carrie mentioned, I'm a Bank of America student leader. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about this. Over the course of eight weeks this past summer, I and four of the teens of the Richmond area were awarded an opportunity to work at a nonprofit and attend a week-long leadership summit right here in DC. 
The summit brought together 222 teams from different backgrounds, but with a common goal, that is to shift the direction of the tides of struggle in our communities. This summer, I also worked at a great organization, the YMCA of Greater Richmond, as a mentor to young individuals. I was their role model, their counselor, their confidant. While being so much more to these young people, I gained so much more. This, was my first, this wasn't my first job, but it was my first real opportunity to buckle down and work hard because working with these young people is no joke. I remember when I was their age and the person who was most influential to me, and that was my mom. She raised us on her own and taught me that perseverance through any challenge, being it taking care of three children, putting food on the table, and a roof over our heads is demanding. She taught me that no matter what you're going through, you have to get your education. A lot of issues are made complex, but this one is simple. Education, job, and leadership opportunities for teens teach many things, responsibility, punctuality, financial awareness, maturity. Jobs help teens have aspirations for future career goals. And did I tell you I'm going to be a cardiac surgeon? When teens see potential opportunities for their future, and when teens are supported on their journeys, our own communities grow and prosper. It was great to be a Bank of America student leader, but the responsibility and expectations are even greater. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to join you here today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Eduardo Padron, President, Miami-Dade College. Good morning, America. Good morning. Buenos dias, America. Buenos dias. Great. Let me first thank my good friend, uh, Mark Edwards, for always finding a way to provide me with a microphone with an accent. Isn't it cool? <laughs> I think it's pretty cool. There is a reason why we're all here today. It's the same reason that has made America the greatest nation on earth. It is the same reason why democracy works. That reason, as you know, it's opportunity. Yes, opportunity is what we all believe in. Opportunity for all, regardless of age, ethnicity, color, religion, sexual orientation, or political party affiliation. Let me suggest, suggest to you, however, that in the 21st century knowledge economy that we live in today, there is only one way to guarantee opportunity for all. And yes, you know the answer. It is that opportunity for accessible and affordable college education. A post-secondary credential today is more and more the ticket to the middle class and also the, the ticket to the enjoyment of the fruits of progress. At a time when that credential is required to access, the more than 60% of all the new jobs that are being created in our nation today, those without it are being relegated to a life in the cycle of poverty. That is not the America we want. That is not the America we dream. In the knowledge economy, a quality college education must become a birthright for all Americans. This is why many of us, college and university presidents, are joining the Higher Education Council at Opportunity Nation. We believe in the power of opportunity and are transforming our respective institutions to do just that. For example, at Miami-Dade College, the largest campus-based institution in the country, serving over 175,000 students. We have rallied the Miami community behind the concept of opportunity. And the community has responded by creating a significant fund that allows to guarantee every high school senior 
in the fourth largest school system in the nation, two years, the first two years of college with free tuition and fees if they graduate from high school with a B, uh, with a B grade and are college ready. That's, thank you. That's what I call real opportunity. And this opportunity is having a transformational impact on the Miami community. There are many other things that we're doing and many other institutions that have come together here at Opportunity Council are doing the same, such as transforming our curriculum to ensure our students acquire the essential skills that are required in today's job market. Critical thinking, analytical skills, ethical values, cross-cultural understanding, and much more. And we're working closely with the business community in our different areas to ensure that our programs are aligned with the needs of the job market. Higher education is quickly becoming the most important industry of the 21st century. It presents a significant opportunity, but also a tremendous responsibility for colleges and universities. We must meet the challenge, because as we say at Miami-Dade College, opportunity changes everything. And as Mark Edwards said at the beginning, we must come together. This generation has the great opportunity to close the opportunity gap. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Elizabeth Clay Roy, Deputy Director, Opportunity Nation. At the core of our campaign is the idea that in America, the circumstances of one's birth, the community they grow up in, should not condemn any person to an inescapable economic fate. We have heard this morning about the challenges we face as a nation and the potential waiting to emerge. But we know from our lived experience that the ladder of opportunity has stronger rungs in some communities than in others. There is not just one America with opportunity or without opportunity. And as we launched this effort, we wondered, how can we work to expand opportunity unless we measure it? So we developed this index in partnership with Measure of America, a project of the Social Science Research Council, and with tremendous support from the United Way Worldwide and our coalition. We built this tool for people to make choices. Some might use it as a map to think about where to live, but most will use it to understand better what is going on in the communities they love so that collectively we can work to solve it. This index measures the conditions present in different communities that constrain or expand opportunity. Unlike personal characteristics, which also have an impact on mobility, these factors are amenable to policy change and to collective efforts to bring about improvements for communities' residents. Are there jobs? Can people afford a home to buy or to rent? Do most young people graduate from high school on time? And are neighbors volunteering? It is these central questions and others like them that are the focus of the Opportunity Index. And we use the data to derive an opportunity score, a comprehensive snapshot of where a community stands today and how it can improve its future. Released for the first time last fall, we shared the index with tens of thousands of people in the first year and you helped us make improvements to this measure. We added associate's degree to post-secondary education and included a measure of income inequality. And we increased the number of counties measured so it now covers 99.7% of the US population. So let's begin by talking about what we found. The Northeast and the Midwest dominate the highest ranks of the opportunity score as seen in darker blue, with the top 10 states split evenly between those two regions. The 16 southern states are disproportionately represented at the bottom of the, in, in the index, with only the four southern states around the nation's capital not clustered near the bottom. The 11 western states largely occupy the middle to lower middle rankings, with three at the very bottom. The top three states in the Opportunity Index are Vermont, North Dakota, and Minnesota. 
Interestingly, none of these three states are the wealthiest as measured by income, but they excel in many other important qualities. For example, low unemployment, low poverty rates, and rank highest in concentration of primary care providers and high school graduation rates. The bottom three states on the Opportunity Index are New Mexico, Mississippi, and Nevada. Across all three dimensions, they score far below the national average, especially in terms of education, as seen in purple. While 75% of American high school freshmen graduate um, in four years, these three states fall to the bottom of the pack. These states are also lagging behind the national average in post-secondary attainment, and the one area where Nevada excels is income, high income, but that's found alongside some of the highest unemployment in the country. And even greater than the divergence between states, there are vast differences between America's counties. Let me share just a couple of examples. In Falls Church City, Virginia, just a few miles from here, nearly three quarters of residents have an associate's degree or higher. While in McDowell County, West Virginia, that figure is less than one in 10. Falls Church City has a robust constellation of public and private schools and colleges to enroll in, while McDowell County schools system just came under state control due to persistently low test scores and high dropout rates. Same America, different opportunities. Even more stark, the percentage of youth in Apache, Arizona, who are not in school or working, is 18 times more than in Dallas County, Iowa, and more than twice the national average. That's over one third of youth there. In Apache, young people exit into an economy with 16% uh, unemployment rate and one of the lowest median incomes in the country. In Dallas County, Iowa, part of West Des Moines, 95% of students graduate on time and unemployment is below the national average. Same America, different opportunities. And while America's 25 largest urban counties are not at the very top or the very bottom of the index, there are real differences. Middlesex County, Massachusetts, which includes the city of Cambridge, is at the top with a B plus grade. Philadelphia, Detroit, San Bernardino are near the bottom with D grades. So we developed this tool to set goals and promote action. In fact, as we've traveled the country and shared the index, we've been engaging with our grassroots opportunity leaders and scholars and other partners to see how they're using the index in their communities. And everywhere we go, we see that the index is not just another data point. The index is a catalyst for change. We will hear three unique stories from community leaders in states that span the rankings and whose own journeys tell us something about the numbers we see. First, we'll hear from Opportunity Leader and former Mayor of St. Paul, Jim Scheibel. I am Opportunity Nation. I am Opportunity St. Paul. Minnesota ranked 23rd. It says we're doing something right, but with 26% of the population in my city living in poverty, that's not good enough. In Minnesota, in Minnesota, we're fortunate to have had great leadership to inspire us. Senator Hubert Humphrey, Senator Paul Wellstone. Senator Wellstone continues to inspire us with this simple formula. We all do better when we all do better. Repeat that with me, please. We all do better when we all do better. That's our motto in putting together our plan. We also, we know behind the statistics, there's always faces. Let me share one story with you. Chai Lee was born in the refugee camps in Thailand. At age one, he came to this country. In St. Paul, he attended public school. And as a senior, he was inspired by a coach and a teacher. And Chai said, I want to go study political science. That teacher was Mark Wellstone, the son of Sheila and Paul Wellstone. Chai did go on, went to Carleton College, and four years did graduate with that degree in political science. Today, he is in charge of constituent services in the mayor's office. And I just have a feeling someday he'll be at a different desk in that mayor's office.
Opportunity St. Paul is working on our plan. And we're building on, we're number three as a state, but we're number one in civic engagement. So the way we work with United Way, community action, business, communities of faith, youth, and particularly low-income people, we are going to increase our index by 10 points over the next few years. And yes, we will do it by remembering we all do better when we all do better. We are Opportunity St. Paul. We are Opportunity Nation. Thank you, Jim. And now we'll hear from Opportunity Leader Stevan Corbett from Nevada. Good morning. It was not until my friends were attending and graduating high school that I realized that I had missed out on something. From my own experience, this is still a reality. It was a culture in our high school where it wasn't important to graduate from high school nor from college nor to even attend based on our economy and the jobs that were provided. In the entertainment industry and in the hospitality in the industry today, it's still very prevalent. This is a culture limiting our economic diversity and the attraction of new businesses to the state of Nevada. I did not want to see this continue in my community where I was born and raised and now where my wife and I raise our three children. We do have opportunity gaps in Nevada specific to education from early childhood all the way up to the post-secondary doctoral degree programs. And this is something that we're working on. In a state where nearly two million people have been added to the state, in the last two decades, there has been a tremendous strain on our resources and how we plan for the future and sustain our comprehensive resources. This tremendous growth contributed to a climate where promotions were administered without proper report, support, and training while recruiting teachers from other counties and states. This played a significant role in the area of cultural and our academic services. This in a district where 238 languages are spoken and we serve over 311,000 students. This lack of planning for this growth has impacted our students and their families as we continue to mend the academic and the social environment. We have made progress toward policies and best practices to support success and have new educational leadership both at the local and the state level. We recognize that the end, what the index shares about our state and feel that it is a powerful tool in addressing the opportunity gaps that do exist. Our goal would be to use the index in setting clear and sustainable goals for Nevada through lateral conversations, not only at the local and state, but also at the national level. Thank you. Thank you, Stevan. And finally, we'll hear from Europe alumna, Yenmi Escobar. Good morning. My name is Yenmi Escobar. I was born in El Salvador. By age four, my parents had immigrated to the U.S. to look for work and a better life. By age five, my parents had brought my two sisters and I to live in Providence, Rhode Island. When my parents separated, my mother brought my two sisters and my younger brother to live in Washington, D.C. We moved to the Columbia Heights Northwest area, where today is an up-and-coming neighborhood being built with condominiums and a small shopping center. There are many changes being made today across the city. Schools are being remodeled, and public charter schools are becoming more popular. The level of education is being improved. But it was not always this way. Growing up in D.C. as a teenager it was difficult for me. I attended Cardozo Senior High School, which at the time was rated one of the worst high schools in Washington, D.C. The Columbia Heights area was an empty lot, which became a hangout area after school for students and small gangs or cliques that had formed. Gangs formed in all nearby neighborhoods and were noticeable in schools. During my four years at Cardozo, I made the best effort I could to rise above the, all the negativity around me. I kept myself busy with many programs. I joined programs like JRTC and debate. I participated in various sports such as soccer, softball, and track. It was easy to see the differences in the city, especially how the level of education and the athletic programs differed from other schools in the city. There were different leagues because there was a lack of funding and, and, urban, and training in urban neighborhoods. I found that Cardozo had some very amazing teachers who were supportive and who truly loved teaching. 
I also found that not all staff was the same. For example, during my junior year, I was stopped in the hall by my counselor, who blatantly asked me why I was applying to so many colleges, because I wasn't going to get in. I was shocked that she would tell me this in the hall in front of my peers. During high school, I was pregnant and had a son during the summer of right before my senior year. I knew at the moment that my life would change and that my priorities would take a huge shift. Becoming a mother meant I was no longer my number one priority. Every decision I made had to not only work for me, but had to be the best decision for my son. After high school, I was prepared for college and I was accepted to many of the colleges that I applied to, but I could not afford to go because I was not eligible for financial aid due to my immigration status. While I attempted to attend multiple colleges, I also had to work to provide for my family. And so, like so many young people in my community, my line of dead-end jobs began. But after I lost my job in 2011, I was at a standstill in my life. I had a son to care for, but had no job, and was not receiving an education. My sister Oneida had been telling me about this great program called JROP that she had just completed in Rhode Island where I would get six months training and six months in an internship. During the program, I was taught the IT skills necessary to enter an entry-level IT position. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I also received credits to Northern Virginia Community College. My opportunities had once again opened, and today I feel much more confident about my future. I'm currently at a contract help desk position at the law firm Baker McKenzie. <clears throat> and will be enrolling back in NOVA in the spring to continue my education. Today, I am writing my own story. Thank you. Thank you, Stavan, Jim, and Yenmi. As we just heard about Washington, D.C., these ranks and scores are not static, and neither are we. If you're born into a county with a low grade, which makes steady progress over a decade, by the time you're 10 years old, you benefit from the positive momentum and new possibilities. Let me share a couple of other quick trends. The good news from the 2011 to 2012 index data is that more states are moving in a positive direction than are sliding back, and over half of counties have stayed the same. Unemployment dropped in most states, and at the county level, the dimension that saw the strongest improvement was education, with 60% of counties seeing upward movement in education indicators, a real step in the right direction. On the other hand, income inequality worsened in over half of states, and most distressing, the rate of youth out of school and out of work rose in 28 states and 57% of counties. There is a robust relationship between the proportion of youth who are not in school and not working and low opportunity as measured by the index. In fact, this indicator has the strongest correlation with opportunity index scores at the state level, underscoring that the fate of this generation is not theirs alone, but that we are all interconnected and interdependent. In the top 10 ranked states, the percentage of disconnected youth dropped slightly but in bottom states, it rose by an average of 1% over the last year. And relatedly, on-time high school graduation and the share of adults with post-secondary education is also strongly correlated with scores. And that's why these are critical rungs that must be mended. Unsurprisingly, counties with more people in poverty have a lower opportunity grade. Across the board, when academic and economic forces align, opportunity index scores rise. So our 10-year goal, and we hope you share this with us, is to increase opportunity scores over the next decade by at least 10% in all 50 states. When we launched the index last year, we couldn't predict all the ways it would spark action, but our grassroots leaders shared the data with elected officials that used the information to start service projects, awareness campaigns. Professors and students brought the index into the classroom to critically examine the relationship between geography and opportunity. So there is a role for each of us in rebuilding the ladder. We've talked today a lot about big numbers, millions of young people who want their shot. And at the county level, these figures quickly transform from abstract numbers to real lives. 
when Opportunity Leader Lyndon Nelson learned that 460 young adults in Wachita County, Arkansas needed to connect to work or school, she stepped up to start an action community beginning with life and career planning workshops for young adults. So take a look now on your name card and see your hometown's grade and the percentage of youth disconnected from school and work there. And on your phone or back at a computer, check out your score at your current address at www.opportunityindex.org. What can you do to reduce that number? What is your organization doing to reduce that number? And once you've identified it, go to our national impact map, get in touch with us, and tell us what you are doing and what we can do together. If you're already involved with a multi-sector effort to expand opportunity, you can incorporate the index in your goal setting. We encourage established institutions and passionate individuals alike to who want to make an impact on their scores to pledge to become an action community, working on a coordinated effort to increase your score. Together, let's rebuild the ladder of opportunity in America for all of us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Mark Edwards. So we've heard time and again today that when young adults do well, communities do well, our entire nation does well. And I think this index has been a powerful, powerful example of just what happens when we get those stars aligned. So how do we create more ladders of opportunity for young adults in this country? First, I think we have to recognize that most young adults don't have the luxury of attending full-time school through grade 16 and then going to work. The truth is that the pathways that they take are, ver are varied, and we need an equally robust set of paths for them to take so that they can achieve their full potential. The workforce is changing, the workplace is changing, we need pathways to reflect this. So I'm gonna briefly walk through our plan and the eight core ideas at the center of it, and we're gonna be spending much of the time from now on really focusing on the particular ideas here that we think are gonna make a powerful difference in creating opportunity. First, we need to increase the number of pathways to one, two, and four-year credentials and degrees. We should be expanding accelerated learning programs, earn and learn programs, early colleges. This is an area of tremendous innovation that's making high school and post-secondary education more relevant and increasing persistence and completion. Kate Matthews, a 20-year-old from our coalition partner, the Roosevelt Institute, supported this idea with a brief on the importance of expanding dual enrollment programs because they're a cost-effective solution to sending more students to college while saving money along the way. Second, career and technical education can be a powerful pathway for, back, for young adults of all backgrounds. Who doesn't believe that being exposed to workplace and career pathways can help? The average high school graduation rates for students concentrating in CTE programs is 90.8%, far higher than the national average for traditional high school paths. Perkins, as you know, is a critical funding source, and we must use its reauthorization to improve it. This was a game-changing pathway for Amelia Powers, whom we'll hear from later today. Amelia was a high school student with no plans for college, who wasn't particularly engaged until she enrolled in one of her high school's career and technical education career clusters through Skills USA. She discovered a natural talent for automotive technology, went on to, went on to get her BS degree, and now works as a regional parts manager for Caterpillar. She credits CTE, particularly because it was paired with other college and career ready programs for making her high school experience more relevant and better. This country is lucky to have her. We must lift up this pathway for all young adults. We have to incentivize innovation with CTE, within CTE that rewards programs that work through a competitive grant program. We've seen how Race to the Top spurred innovation we should build on that success. IBM's P-Tech Academy is just one great example of an innovative public-private partnership. You're gonna hear a lot more about that in our next panel. But while we're fostering innovation, we must also support programs that work. In this room alone, there are many, many programs that are collaborative, data-driven, and have young people at the center. Demand for these programs that far outstrips supply we should be sustaining and expanding programs that currently produce economically quantifiable results for young adults and employers. We should also pilot pay-for-success programs that leverage private sector support 
of innovation. Now, quick show of hands. How many of you owe a job or part of your success to a mentor? Family member, coach, volunteer? For me, it was a guy named Mr. George Mangan, a high school, an irascible high school teacher who taught me how to write and encouraged me to aim high. We know that mentoring works, and it's something all of us can do. Mentoring drives school completion, keeps young people on the career ladder. Number six, we have to acknowledge that this life, that life is complicated, and some young adults fall off the ladder of opportunity. Youth Opportunity Grants are a powerful way to reconnect young adults because they coordinate the public school system, the juvenile justice system, the private sector, and community-based solutions. And there are studies that prove their effectiveness. Miami-Dade College, one of our members of our Higher Education Council, has done an extraordinary job of collaborating with the K-12 system and employers to build secure, secure pipelines all the way to a W-2. We should foster these collaborations. Seventh, we know how critical the advice and input of guidance counselors are, yet on average, high school guidance counselors have 476 students to support. We should be using technology to develop a single web portal where students can monitor their progress, make sure they're taking the right courses, and we can also make sure that they, are taking, uh, that they get exposed to all the kind of career options that they need. If we pair this with a college savings account, we have a chance to reach many more low-income students and increase access to college. Senators Rubio and Coons from both sides, two legislators we're going to hear from later this afternoon, have co-sponsored a similar bill that's going to, that we're going to hear about later on today. And finally, we have to engage employers. Employers can provide internships, help with continuing education, and of course, jobs. There have been powerful partnerships where employers, nonprofits, community colleges, and foundations have come together to make enormous differences in communities. One of, our call, one of our calls to action today is to encourage companies to use the White House Council for Community Solutions Employer Toolkit, a really powerful online tool to help employers assess how well their capacity to engage with young adults. So if you're sitting next to an employer today, and I'm thrilled about how many employers are here in this room today, tell them about the toolkit. So these are the eight core ideas of our plan. Together, they form the basis of our shared plan. We're going to be discussing all these ideas in much more detail in our breakout sessions and over lunch. Everyone in this room is doing incredible work that's focused on promoting opportunity. But we really do believe with these eight ideas, we can come together to take this to a higher level. I'd like now to introduce our next panel, made up of some of the most innovative programs already aligned with our plan and having an, imp an impact all around the country. Again, many of you are doing a lot of this work already, but we're excited about the fact that these programs have really come together to show that, in fact, the ideas in the plan are already in place and making a difference. Please welcome Dr. Diana Natalicio, President of the University of Texas at El Paso, Robert Schwartz, Academic Dean at Harvard University's Graduate School of Education, Jeff Edmondson, Managing Director of the Strive Network, Stacy Holland, co-founder, president, and CEO of the Philadelphia Youth Network, Gail Gershon, director of employee engagement at the Gap Foundation, Stan Litow, vice president of corporate citizenship and corporate affairs at IBM and president of the IBM Foundation. And lastly, I'd like to introduce our panel moderator, Rana Faruhar, assistant managing editor at Time, who's been a consistent advocate on our issues. Rana wrote last year's Time Magazine's cover story that broke the day of our summit on economic mobility. Mark, thanks to all of the panel, and thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I consider economic opportunity and mobility to be really one of the most important issues facing the country right now, and it's something that we're following incredibly closely at the magazine, um, and I feel very lucky to be discussing it with all of you today. Um, just to say a couple of words to start, mobility and opportunity is traditionally uh, an economic competitive advantage for this country. We've always had a great level of mobility uh, historically compared to Europe, for example. But as we know, and as we reported last year, that's starting to change, and that is a real worry. Uh, we have a youth unemployment crisis right now, as, as all of you know so well. Um, but there is good news, too. There are jobs being created. There are 14 million new jobs that are going to be created in the next 10 years. 
but they are jobs that will require a certain level of training, often a community college degree, and better alignment of the needs of employers with the educational system. Um, so we're here to talk about these things and, and many other things today. I've been told I have 20 minutes, but I may go rogue and make it 22. We'll see. Um, so everyone <laughs> speak, speak succinctly and, and draw out the color in your stories. And I'm going to start with um, a question for a couple of you, Jeff and Stacy, just to start, because you're working with some of the most vulnerable populations. And I want to hear a little bit about the way in which you're working with high school dropouts and these very vulnerable kids to get them back on the track and reintegrate them. And if you want to share some of your stories and your, your most colorful examples of how that's working, that would be great. Great, great. Um, it's wonderful to have the opportunity. I'd just like to credit Mark and his team for this wonderful plan. Uh, I think the work we're doing is really connected to the piece on creating action communities. Um, the idea being is that uh, essentially assuming that we can address the dropout issue with the education system alone is quite simply flawed. Uh, the, the idea of the Little Red Schoolhouse being the sole owner of educational excellence is long past. And really everybody in this room, everybody in a community shares some of the responsibility. Um, and our historical definition of collaboration as we've defined it, uh, as one community member that we, we worked with said, it, it sort of just feels like a kumbaya circle um, as opposed to something really purposeful. And in essence, it's led to what we call spray and pray, where you're spraying resources all over the place and you're praying that really good things happen. Uh, and what we've got to start doing and what we were able to do in Cincinnati and we're continuing now to do with over uh, 60 communities across the country is figure out how to bring together all these cross-sector leaders from the education, business, nonprofit, philanthropic, and civ uh, civic sectors to build what we call the cradle-to-career civic infrastructure. Uh, and this is essentially a way to have what many are calling collective impact. Uh, but the bottom line idea is, is if you can bring all these key leaders together who have their finger on resources to start agreeing on a common vision, and that's great, but more importantly, agreeing on some outcomes they want to move. So outcomes like, are we re-engaging youth that are already out to make sure that they don't just get back into school of some sort, but they actually succeed once they get there and get placed in some form of employment? Are we actually doing that? And then not just investing in every great idea, but actually looking at their local data and saying what is working right now in our hometown that we could lift up and do more of. Uh, and that's probably a great opportunity to pass it on uh, to the great work with that, uh, that Project U-Turn is doing. But the idea would be is that in every community there are things like this that we can lift up and sometimes pull in. And our belief is if you pull all these leaders together and begin to identify those initiatives, you can begin to actually build your own civic infrastructure right in your own backyard. Um, thanks, Jeff. So Project U-Turn is Philadelphia's response to how we are going to solve the dropout crisis. And the way that we do that is based on a basic belief. We believe all young people can succeed, both economically and educationally. So this is a cross-sector collaborative that actually is comprised of our local leaders and city government, our philanthropic community, our employer community, educational community, and our social service and nonprofit community. And through that belief, we basically looked at four things. We looked at one, the data. Who are our young people? Can we tell the truth about them? And understanding and digging deep into your data is, is critical. Second is, once you understand who your young people are, what types of services do they need? What's the infrastructure, as Jeff talked about? So we looked at our educational system and realized that we did not have enough opportunities that matched the needs of our young people. So we needed to build seats. We needed to create new high schools and new um, out of school time opportunities. The third is how do you keep youth voice at the center? Kids are our clients and at the end of the day, they're gonna be our future. If we don't figure out a way to hear from them and build interventions that meet their need, then at the end of the day, we will have missed the boat. And the third is, the fourth is how do you align and leverage the money that already exists? How do you take those investors and then figure out a new way to use that money and create an entire systemic process? So we're six years in and we've seen an increase in our high school graduation rate from 48% to 61%. We've created 5,000 new educational seats. Um, and I believe one of our young people is uh, speaking on a panel, Ramin, um, in the afternoon, who's gonna tell his story about in our multiple pathway system, but Project U-Turn really has been, I think, a phenomenal transformation agenda. Okay, 
Well, I love the idea of kids as clients. That's a great phrase to keep in mind. And I'm really interested in what both of you were saying about mismatches, because as we know, the mismatch between skills uh, and jobs that are available is, is a big part of what's been happening in this story of the, the downturn and the recovery. Some economists believe that as much as uh, two-thirds of unemployment is a result of that mismatch. So there's a, a number of folks here that can speak to that, and I want to invite you, uh, Stan, uh, Bob, and Diana, because you're at the intersection, all of you, between bringing together educators and job creators. And uh, since Stan is sitting next to me and, and I know a little bit about P-TECH, why don't you start, and then Bob and Diana, I want to hear from you as well on this. Well, I think that the idea of uh, changing the uh, construct of high school and community college in America is right at the core of the problem that you outlined. If there are going to be 14 million jobs over a 10-year period, that's great. And if you look at our community college two-year completion rates overall at 25 percent, and you look at the skill deficiencies that kids who have high school diplomas have, we obviously need some game-changing activities that are going to really create a new opportunity. And part of that is going to involve getting business, higher education, and our school leaders together, community by community, to forge different collaboratives. The thing that we did starting in New York City, the PTEC program, which has been referred to earlier, is a six-year program. Every student completes with both a high school diploma and an associate's degree in computer science or applied sciences. And first in line, for jobs at IBM, which is a powerful incentive. But if you went to the school and you went into the classrooms, you'd see the students being educated with their core skills matched up to the entry-level skill requirements for jobs in the industry. So what would be going on in the classroom would be very different from what would be experienced in a normal classroom. And if you look at this school in Brooklyn, uh, in a tough neighborhood with no special admission criteria, no special charter school rules or regulations. At the end of the first year, very high attendance, very high completion rates, and the students already taking uh, college courses in the 10th grade, and doing better than your normal student would do with a high school diploma. So that's the new way of thinking, creating a new opportunity. But we can't just wave a magic wand and imagine that it's going to happen. We actually have to do things differently, and that's what this lesson is about. And I think it connects directly to the Opportunity Nation agenda of reforming Perkins Act money to incent schools uh, to be able to provide connections to labor market information so that their uh, training is for real jobs and real careers, uh, getting higher education and business to the table in a substantive way, and providing a real bright future for larger and no larger numbers of young people. And that's how we take advantage of those 14 million jobs and make the U.S. competitive. Okay. I've been in this school, actually, and I will just say that the energy is incredible. And uh, technologically, in particular, these kids are way ahead of me, I will just say. <laughs> um, so, Bob, um, I know that you've dealt with these same paradigms. You've written the Pathways to Prosperity report. Do you agree with what Stan's just said? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, um, I just wanted to make two comments, uh, both pivoting off of Stan's. I think one of the things that's different about this era from earlier uh, efforts to really engage employers with schools in a more collaborative and effective way is I think at this point in the economy, we have in the healthcare sector, in the uh, information technology, in advanced manufacturing, you've got employers who are genuinely worried about their future workforce. And that's the motivation that you really want to tap into. It's enlightened economic self-interest um, is the, more, the most powerful lever to really get bring employers to the table and, and keep them there. PTEC, in my mind, builds off of, it's a natural kind of extension of the experience from two very powerful models that we now have a, a lot of experience with. One is the career academy model, the high school reform model that mixes strong academics and strong career and technical uh, education with a focus. There are probably 6,000 of these or so around the country. The National Academy Foundation, I think of as the kind of gold standard here. Uh, it runs about 500 of these. It's been in business 30 years. It has very strong data to support the argument that if you really can <coughs> combine these two things, a strong academic foundation with a strong technical and career focus, you can give kids at least some opportunities for paid internships while they're in school. You can really motivate them to stay in school, complete, and go on to higher education. 
The other national network, uh, which is now about 10 years old, was actually launched with some seed money from the Gates Foundation. Uh, this is the early college high school model. And that's a model that basically says um, the best way to get to ensure that kids are really prepared for and ready for higher education is to get them started on post-secondary education while they're still in high school. There are 270 um, early college high schools around the country in this national network that's coordinated by Jobs for the Future, a Boston-based uh, nonprofit. More than half of the class of, two, of 2011 is completing high school with two years of college credit. This may be a nice segue to Diana because um, <laughs> Texas is one of the states that really has embraced the uh, ECHS model and I think uh, it's really provided some, some national examples worth studying here. Okay, great. Diana, tell us what's happening at UT. Well, first, I, th I think it's important to recognize that a public university like ours located in the U.S.-Mexico border region um, has to think very hard about its role and mission and how it's going to serve the people of that region. That's what public universities are supposed to do. And so uh, many years ago when I became president, one of the things that we did was to take a look at who we were and whom we served and whom we didn't serve. And we began to understand through data and careful analysis that we were increasingly out of sync with the demographics of the region. And so we set off on a quest to form a partnership with the school districts from which we draw approximately 80% of our students and the El Paso Community College, which is the only two-year institution in our region. And we formed something called the El Paso Collaborative for Academic Excellence, which was an effort to raise aspirations and educational attainment among all young people in the region. Far too many young people were told over and over again that they weren't college material. And so we were squandering huge amounts of talent on very weak grounds. And so we began this collaborative. We worked with teachers. We had a lot of wonderful support from foundations, from the National Science Foundation and others. And it does take partners. We all have to work together. Um, and we have now a student demographic that absolutely mirrors uh, the demographic of the region we serve. And I consider that to be, frankly, one of the best outcomes that we could have hoped for. So we're now 77% Hispanic, and we look like El Paso, which is what a public university in a region like ours should. Um, the early college high schools, to that point, um, have been an extension of those partnerships. So we have six early college high schools in the El Paso area. And UTEP is enrolling uh, graduates of these high schools who come with not only their high school diplomas, but their associate's degrees. And these are speedsters. These students move along very fast. Some of them actually finish their associate's degree before they complete their high school diploma. Huh. So they come to us at the end of the junior year, and uh, at the end of their junior year in high school, and their juniors at UTEP at the same time, they finish their senior year in high school and their degree at UTEP within the next year or year and a half. And it's quite an amazing accomplishment. What's really interesting are the policy implications of a lot of these things. These speedster students, these accelerated students, can't get federal financial aid to come early to UTEP if they finish their associate's degree at the end of the junior year because they haven't graduated from high school. <laughs> and so we have to figure out ways to get the policy framework to be more supportive. Let me just say one other thing because the partnership with uh, the business sector has been hugely important for us. We are an engineering and science school at our founding. We were a mining school. So we produce more Hispanic engineers than almost any university in the country. And we've been discovered by companies that have this workforce concern that we talked about a moment ago. And they know that their future workforce depends on institutions like ours. And so we've had companies like IBM and many others that have partnered with us over the years to try to build capacity and to encourage more young people uh, to pursue careers, particularly in STEM. So it, it takes not only a village, it takes a country. It's amazing. All right, well, we're going to... I want to come back to that, but I want to turn for a moment uh, from education to the idea of on-the-job training and what that looks like. And Gail, I know that you guys at The Gap have done a tremendous amount with that.
tell us a little bit about how it works and also tell us about the soft skills uh, that the kids are learning because I think that that's really important, the idea of, of training these kids in these skills that some people, you know, sort of get in the air that they breathe but not everyone does. Right. I'm going to steal a phrase I heard this morning uh, for the first time from Bronca Minnick. She said, we hire for hard skills, we fire for soft skills. So clearly soft skills are super important. That's a really great way that employers can get involved. Of course, if companies have entry-level jobs, great, set up internships, set up learn and earn programs. But for those employers that don't have those kinds of programs, that's a big part of what we were thinking about in creating the uh, toolkit, the White House Council for Community Solutions Toolkit, that guides employers on one of three pathways for supporting youth. The first is around soft skills, the second is around work-ready skills, and the third is the creation of learn and earn programs. If you haven't seen the website, I'd check it out. Um, it's a great way, especially for companies that have very strong volunteer programs. I'm, I'm sure a lot of the uh, the employers that are in the room come from companies where increasingly that's just part of, of what we do in corporate America nowadays. And it's something that is so valuable that we can build into those kind of employee volunteer programs. Okay, great. Well, we have three minutes, although I may make it five, um, <laughs> as I threatened in the beginning. I want to go down the row here and have everyone very quickly say what you would need to do to take the ideas and the successes that you've had in your organizations, in your institutions, and take that national. What do you need? Well, I would say first you need the uh, combined collaborative power of business, higher education, uh, the people in K-12, and the people in the civic community to change how we do business. Uh, the Opportunity Nation agenda was to change how we sustain and support career and technical education in the country to create incentives that connect the kind of training that people do to the jobs that are out there, get business involved in a really meaningful way. Volunteer opportunities are great, but we need to fix the curriculum so that kids are engaged and energized uh, to change how they learn. Uh, thank you. And I think some of the things that were identified don't require an act of Congress, and they don't require a change in our federal budgets or state budgets. They require a real commitment to doing things differently. In the United States, it wasn't until after the Second World War that high school was mandatory. Before that, it was optional. We made a big change in this country, and you could argue that that made a big change in the U.S. economy in the 20th century. Now is an opportunity to make a big change in the 21st century. Well put. Gail? I think we need to change the units of time we think about. We're really focused on today and tomorrow and this year, and if we can shift the time frame, um, we have to worry about five years from now, ten years from now, and I think that's a big part of what corporate America and thinking about future employees and future co customers. At a company like Gap Inc., we need customers that are going to want to continue to have, uh, that they need money in their pockets to buy those jeans and t-shirts. Um, so they need jobs, and we need to shift our thinking about time frames. I love that, taking a long view. So important on any number of levels. Stacey. I would say two things. Political will. We have to be willing to change our policies. We create disengaged students. They're not born. So we have to change those policies in our educational agenda. <laughs> And the second thing is we need financial will. We need the investors that are interested in this topic to support a long view of solutions within local communities. Okay, you here. So building on that, I think it's, it's it, it, part of the shift in the, to get to the long view and to get to this different financial uh, perspective is to, is to totally shift from a charitable mentality to an investment mentality. To say that, to say that every, to, to say that the success of every child is directly linked to our success uh, economically and our success as a nation. And possibly the least sexy answer uh, in getting us to this investment mentality would be to say that we actually need comprehensive data management systems. We need to really understand. We need to have the data on what students really need, where they are, right now so that all the services that we may have in our community already or the great opportunities that exist outside our community can actually be targeted to what a child needs, not what we think they need. Uh, so getting to that point is going to be critical. 
in uh, 2010, I had the opportunity to take part uh, in a 17-country study um, called Learning for Jobs. This was done by OECD, and it looked at how other countries managed to build pathways that move the majority of the young people from high school with post-secondary education and training and on into the, the workforce. Um, two themes uh, really struck me and we built into our Pathways to Prosperity report. Uh, one, and perhaps the most important, is the countries that do this well don't simply think about this as helping kids make the transition from school to work. They think of it in broader social and developmental terms, helping all young people make a successful transition from adolescence to adulthood with lots of community support. And the second related point is uh, that we called for in our report is to really create a kind of public social compact, if you will, between the larger adult society and young people. So young people, all young people can see a visible opportunity structure in front of them. They can see the potential for support, but they also get the message they need to really pitch in and do their part in order to, to realize their uh, potential. Okay. Diane. I think uh, it's very hard to be last, by the way, because all the <laughs> really good ideas I had in my head are, are articulated so well. But I, I do think that uh, changing attitudes about the enterprise that we're all engaged in here is extraordinarily important. I think the media have a huge role to play in this. And it is not only about creating access and offering students a pathway, but it's also ensuring that whatever it is that we do to provide them with opportunities is of the highest quality. Because one of the big concerns that I have now is that as we look at jobs and workforce training, there's a tendency to segment that mm. away from what I would consider to be excellence. These young people, for the most part, are just as talented as, for the most part, are those in more affluent settings. And so what we must do is to ensure that we give them every opportunity to compete at the highest level. And that means going on to graduate school or professional school. That means doing all the things that they have every right to expect. Okay, well that's great stuff from all of you. It's been a very short panel, but we have taken the long view, I think. <laughs> and uh, I wanna thank you all for being here and thanks for having us. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Parker, Youth Build USA, and Diamond Jimenez, you're up. Wow, 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 wow. Wow. First, let's give everybody a round of applause for making it here today, all of our young leaders, all of our representatives, all of our civic engagers. And good morning to everybody here. Good morning to all the young leaders in the audience. Let's understand why we're here. What's the purpose of us being here right now? It's for opportunity. And hello to all the allies that have come here from Opportunity Nation Summit to put forward a powerful and unified plan to expand opportunity for young people across our nation. I want to welcome you all to the National Young Leaders Town Hall. My name is Michael Parker, a proud graduate of Youth Build East Harlem, the first youth build program in the country. Thank you. I stand before you here a proud father of three young boys. Yes, I have been busy. And <laughs> a proud graduate of the AmeriCorps program where I personally completed over 1,700 community service hours in our community program. And most importantly, an active and model citizen in my East Harlem community, working in youth action programs and homes as a transitional coordinator and case manager. We are here from many organizations, from Year Up to Youth Build USA, Public Allies, Core Network, National Congress of Native Americans, Youth Leadership Institute, Job for the Futures, and many other important and prominent organizations. Today you'll be speaking with more than, today we'll be speaking for more than 6.7 million young people that are disadvantaged in our communities. Too many times we're being called the voices of the voiceless, and I believe that today we'll have the opportunity to speak for all of these young people and speak on their behalf and speak about their opportunities and what we need is very important. Diamond? Good morning, everyone. 
My name is Diamond Jimenez. I'm a graduate of Europe, New York City, class of January 2011. Today, I'm proud to say I am a help desk administrator at Tower Research Capital for two years. I'm starting back my college education, and I'm here with all of you showing that there is an opportunity, not just for one, but all of us. And basically, what that means is this gives hope to our future leaders. Here at Opportunity Nation, we have an amazing chance to really learn from all of our experts and political leaders about the state of opportunity in America. We've looked at the Opportunity Index, which proves, using data, what all of us young leaders know from our life experiences. Opportunity is different depending on which zip code we are born into. Now we're going to bring some different type of data to the table. We are going to make the real tremendous assets that flow to this nation when people invest in us and every young person in this country, regardless of your zip code. This is the moment for everyone to hear our voices of all you young leaders in this room. And when I mean all, I mean each and every one of you. We ask that all of our allies, please sit back, relax, and take the next 30 minutes to really listen to what we have to say. Our shared goal for the Opportunity Nation plan is to increase opportunity score in all states by 10% in 10 years. The truth is that this goal is easily, and when I say easily, I mean easily within reach. We already know as young leaders what works and what doesn't work from our own experiences. So we want to hear from all of the young leaders in the audience who have struggled to grab a piece of this American pie, a pie that they promised to us. Some might say that they owe it to us. And most of all, that we come together to degree and discuss what possibly works. We're going to kick off this open mic conversation among young people with two of our peers up here on stage. But before we do that, we want to hear from each and every one of you. Unfortunately, we won't have the time to hear from each and every one of you. I truly wish we could, but instead I ask that every young leader in the audience, now's the time, take out your cell phone, your tablets, your iPods, your iPads, and text what works. What is the most important pathway to opportunities for young people? And now, it is my pleasure to introduce a fellow mentor, a friend, and a fellow youth build leader from Los Angeles, California, Ellie Flores. So uh, I come here today representing uh, Youth Build, uh, but beyond that representing a vision and an idea for what real youth leadership development is and a real opportunity as success really means. Um, but along with that, I'm not alone. As you heard already, I have my brothers and my sisters here from, from Youth Build, right? And uh, so it's only fair that I introduce to you, to you some of them as well. Um, because I feel like what I'm saying is like a collective voice, right? So we have Julian Ramirez, who is in a room, master's degrees, uh, does HIV testing and life education in Florida. Beyond that, he is a master facilitator and a leadership developer. Uh, Kareem Abar relocated to Mississippi after Hurricane Katrina to help the rebuilding efforts. Now she's back to Illinois, her home, uh, and works at the Youth Build program. Be sweet. Years and years of experience in youth development. Along with that, she is also a fellow Public Allies alumni along with me. So, so I know Public Allies is in the house too. So, um, and then you got me, right? You got Ellie Flores, and I just refer to myself as a social entrepreneur. Right? And uh, these examples are, are stuff, are things that, what opportunities can do for someone, right? And so with all that said, I want to ask you, though, who deserves opportunities? Is it a right? And is it a privilege? And what opportunities am I referring to? The opportunity to an adequate education, post-secondary education, an opportunity to a livable wage job? What about an opportunity at leadership? If you've had good grades in school and have done well in college and have had make, made great decisions throughout your life, then yes, you deserve an opportunity at success. But that wasn't necessarily my case. And if you look around the room and you speak to youth field graduates here, that wasn't necessarily their case either. Does a young lady who come from the foster care system and dealt with abuse all her life deserve an opportunity at success? Does a young man who was, formerly, who was a former gang member deserve an opportunity at success? 
What about someone who has been incarcerated before? Do they deserve an opportunity at success? In many cases, I hear, well, these people reap what they sow. Well, you have to tie up your bootstraps, stop complaining, and work harder. Or maybe you work better with your hands than you do with your brain. Yeah, these things may sound harsh, but these things are stuff that we're hearing every single day. And our young people right now are hearing every single day. It seems that many, many of us and many of these individuals are marginalized and given the smallest amount of resources, and people like me can't help but think that success was not meant for me. Well, someone gave me an opportunity of success, and I took it, and I ran with it. And I can stand here as Ali Flores, and I can stand here as the community organizer. I can stand here as the founder of an organization. I can stand here as the outreach court manager for Great Alternatives. I can stand here as whoever I want to stand here as, and you nor no one else can refer to me in anything otherwise. Not a dropout, not the adjudicated, not the at risk, not the gang member, not the one who almost made it. And please do not refer to me as the future. I hate being told I'm the future because I'm the now. <laughs> now, how is my success possible? Well, it, it really takes a lot of folks to talk about what opportunity really means, right? And then there has to be an investment. So first there was an investment put forth by individuals that believed that success was a right. So youth build invest, the investment of youth build in us was far beyond monetary. It came with adequate education, came with support and real case management, came with expectations at greatness, came with leadership opportunities, and came with a space that empowered us to find who we really are and our actual voice. Every young person across the country constantly talks to elected officials about making sure that programs like youth build continue to be funded because we know what an opportunity can mean. And many times it's the difference between freedom and incarceration. It's the difference between happiness and bitterness, right? It's the difference between life and death. I heard this quote once, which was pretty interesting. It says, when one door shuts, one door opens. And then I thought that quote was really good, but then I couldn't help but ask myself, what if there's no doors open in the first place? Right? Then what happens, right? There's little doors open for success, right? Yet in the hood, we have an overabundance of police in this area versus that area, an overabundance of policies that make our situation worse, an overabundance of incarceration facilities, and very few places for education, right? So that being said, I applaud you uh, for being here today and being the champion for opportunities because it takes a lot of guts, it takes a lot of passion, and it takes a lot of will to say opportunity is not a privilege opportunity is a right. So no matter what my economic background, educational background, criminal background, or simply my ethnic background, everyone who wants an opportunity has a right to an opportunity, and we who have received the opportunity need to continue to open those doors for those who have not. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. I want to say again, thank you, Eli, that was wonderful, and actually, what you guys are writing up there is wonderful as well, keep that up. But now to keep us moving, I'm proud to introduce my friend and fellow alum from Europe and Boston, someone who has a real strong, vibrant personality, Greg Walton. My name is Gregory Walton and I'm a graduate of the Europe program from Boston, January 2007. I was raised by a single mother, dealing with her own issues of drug addiction, which meant I spent a bunch of my childhood bouncing around. I went through the foster care system, living with other family members, et cetera, and at 13, I had to deal with the reality that my younger sisters were to be adopted, and I may never see them again. Till this day, I've only been able to find one of them. By 17, I was on my own, still very immature, lacking guidance, support, confidence, and most of all, love. My life growing up was similar to many young black men in this country, and it's sad. Sure, I wasn't all bad, and I actually accomplished a few things. I was the first to graduate from high school in my immediate family and went off to college, but I still lacked direction and focus on what was important. It wasn't until I hit a real low point and experienced time in prison 
separated away from my family, friends, and loved ones, that I got serious about my life and started to reach out to positive people for help. That's when I was introduced to the Year Up program, where I was able to work on myself and develop my skills while also challenging myself to grow in new ways. Suddenly, I was surrounded by other young people on this same journey, similar obstacles to overcome, but also the similar drive to want more for themselves, their family, and their communities. Europe became my newfound network and the foundation that helped catapult me to new heights. What I needed was an opportunity, and they gave me one. I now, sit I now stand before you, a 27-year-old married man, a proud father, a homeowner, an employee at one of the world's most prestigious, prestigious educational institutions, MIT. and the first alum of the Year Up program to join its national board of directors. Thank you. The feeling of coming to my home after a long day at work, seeing my son play in his room and cooking with my wife in our kitchen is unbelievable. But this isn't about me. This is about the millions of young adults in this country that need that same opportunity that I got. And I'm here to tell you all today, it's my lifelong mission to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And now we want to hear from all of you, young leaders out here in the audience, from your own life experiences. What works? What opens pathways for opportunity? So I think I will. Hi, everyone. My name is Diana Carrillo, and I have been working in Conservation Corp North Bay in California for two years. Here, we work and study at the same time. We are helping protect the environment and have a better and safe community. We also have the opportunity to get an education. Young people like me can learn English as a second language and get support to get our high school diplomas. We earn college scholarships and get help to continue or education through attending college. To me, be part of this project is a great satisfaction because when I started at CCMB, I could not speak English. At CCMB, I learned English. I got my GED and I am working to get in my high school diploma. And I will attend college. Here, I have the opportunity to be a better person, uh, be a good example for my daughter. Conservation Corp North Bay is the place that young people need to have a better future. Thank you. OK, so this gets good. Do I have two people that would like to answer this question as well from this area right here? Or should I pick randomly? Oh, OK, I'll, I'll pick randomly. The question is, sir, what works, what opens pathways for opportunity? More exposure to opportunity itself, I think. Um, I'm coming from Chicago, uh, even though we're a new class. 
Yeah, so I'm class two alumni, but you know, I think the youth just need more exposure. You know, it's a lot of people who don't know about Europe, you know, and it's a definitely a blessing in disguise at the same time. You know, I'm, I work school, own uh, apartment, two cars, so it's definitely a blessing to be here. So that's what I think we need, more exposure to it, you know. We need to spread the word and have more summits and stuff like this, just do things just like this every year, you know. That's what I think. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. How you doing? My name is B. Sweet. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm with my Youth Bill family. Also a graduate of Public Allies LA, PA in the house. So I just, I just want to share authentically that uh, words do not create change. Okay, we could stand here and we could say a good game and we, you know, we on TV and all that, but words do not create change. Action does. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Education does not create change. Education does not create change. It helps, but it doesn't create change. People authentically, honestly, lovingly, connecting with connecting in peace and in partnership creates change okay listening to one another embracing one another allowing the true self to be seen and heard uh, creates change Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Hernandez uh, from Los Angeles, California. Um, what works, uh, I'll tell you what works for me, or had, has worked for me, is definitely a quality education. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm definitely working class. My parents are blue collar. Um, son of a bus boy, and my mo mother used to be a former night custodian. And if it wasn't for a quality education, I wouldn't be here today. If it wasn't for quality teachers that I had in my life, I wouldn't be here today. And I know we all talk about hard work and individual initiative, and that's amazing because I think the American dream still exists. Uh, however, we do have to acknowledge that it's opportunity that opens those doors and breaks those barriers. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why I chose to be a Teacher for America Corps member, and I'll be teaching in Los Angeles next year, 2013. So quality education. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Give them all a round of applause for speaking their opinions and just being very much about it. Now we want to shift the question a little bit. We're not youth anymore. We're young leaders and active citizens, late 20s, early 30s, holding down full-time jobs, looking for work. And a funny thing happened to me yesterday. I was talking to my son on the phone yesterday after going through a multitude of rehearsals and, and conversations yesterday. And my son says, Daddy, I knew you were sick, so I left your asthma pump in your suitcase yesterday. In East Harlem, the asthma rate is extremely high. And the medication costs are extremely high as well. Between me and my three sons, we have to share one asthma pump between the four of us. And it really bothered me yesterday that, first I enjoyed it and I, and I was appreciative that he actually put his asthma inhaler in my suitcase. But then coming here today, I said, this is not the America that they promised us. This is not the challenges that they said that we was going to face. They did not tell us that when we went to school and we were taxpaying citizens, that I would have to choose between buying food for my family or paying for medication for myself and my children. So those are the challenges that I'm facing here today. And the questions that I ask you guys is, what are the challenges that you guys face here today? We've all left huge burdens back at home to be here, to represent for many voices. So I would like to select two people, and Diamond will select two people of what are your challenges facing here today? And Jamea, just so you know, because I know you're watching, Daddy has an asthma pump. So, so can I have two people? Anyone want to volunteer? I'll take you with the blue shirt. And I'll take you So, ladies first. Hi, everyone. My name is Annika. I'm from Europe, New York. Graduated in 09. We face a lot of challenges, and like we heard on the panel too, it starts early in education. It starts with extracurricular activities. Our youth are not getting that. 
Our children are not getting that. The school zones, because of the zip codes we live in, we can't get to those better schools. Our children can't get all those programs and all the extras that probably well-off families always get. And that's what we need in our school zones for our schools to offer our children what they need to, be, to, su to succeed in this life and to succeed and have be on this stage. So we don't have to have this opportunity to buy. We can eliminate all these programs right here if we do this, start early. Thank you. Doing. I'm Shakir from uh, Youthville, Newark. YB, we in here. Uh, the question was, uh, what challenges are we facing? I think education discrimination is basically what it is. You know, that's the only way we can move forward is if everybody is educated in a fashion to as though you know that with that knowledge you can do better. You can change because you know what you know to be true. The, with the, with the, um, the zip codes being what they are, I'm a little nervous, you guys, but bear with me. Um, with the zip codes being what they are, and it's like education based on that, uh, now we have that education, like we know that. So we can take that education with us and go back and enlighten other people so that you don't have to be ignorant to the fact anymore. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Um, my name is William Tarter, and I'm the president of the Cleveland Young Professional Senate. We're a civic engagement organization for young professionals in the greater Cleveland area. And when I think about the challenges that exist among young people, uh, it comes down to this. Find an example and be an example. Find an example you need to have elders, and you need to have people who are quick to teach. And what we need to do as young people is be swift to hear. To be swift to hear and swift to learn. So the challenge for us is to be open to the wisdom and experience of people that have gone before us. And just as important, be willing to teach yourself and to be an example to the people who are coming behind you. Someone is always watching. Someone is always looking to you as an example. And you never know, the people that you look up to and be an example, people could one day be looking at you to be their example. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one more. Hi, my name is Brianne Alexander. I'm from Saginaw, Michigan, and I'm a AmeriCorps member, placed at Grand Rapids Community Foundation. And I would say the main thing that we need are more opportunities for young people to experience experiential learning in the classroom through service learning and through job training programs that allows them to see things that they are not typically exposed to. We need to give young people and be willing to take chances on young people being exposed to boardroom experiences. Place young, young people on your boards, allow them to voice their opinions, give them the opportunity, and we're gonna use that word a lot, but give them the opportunity to experience things and situations that you may not think that they're ready for, but I can guarantee you, and every young person out here can guarantee you, they're ready to step up, they're ready to take a challenge, they're ready to make a stand, and they'll make a difference. Simon, what challenges are you facing? Huh? What challenges are you facing? Well, my challenges aren't like everyone else's, but you can relate. Basically, I say a challenge for me is basically staying motivated in my college studies, particularly as I balance school and work. It's not easy to find time for classes and homework, but I also have to stay focused on my studies. I find like everything so interesting from every major. I think I just want to know it all so that basically I can tell everybody about it and always have something to steer a conversation. But 
I basically learned to stay focused on just achieving that degree. No matter what it's in, as long as I have one, I have something that can open the door for me. So basically my main focus is just completing my degree with something, no matter what it is. It could be cooking, it could be literature. As long as I have something, it's going to work. So that's, that's my challenge. Well, I would like to thank everybody here for opening their hearts, sharing their insights, letting us in on experiences. I wish we had time to hear from each and every one of us right now. But the good news is we will be continuing this conversation right after lunch at the National Gathering of Young Leaders and Allies and in other breakout sessions. So hold your ideas and thoughts and bring them with you to lunch and let's keep this conversation going. But I need you all to take a second and look at your name tag. Now, I know all of you know your name, but I need you to look at if you're a young leader or not. And most of you in the front should be young leaders and some of you in the back, so please raise your hand if you're a young leader. Please raise them high. Thank you. Michael. We'd like to ask everyone whose breakout session is with the gathering of young leaders and allies to get up on your feet. In a minute, you're going to follow Diamond and myself out of the auditorium to the next building, third floor, where we'll get lunch. But I have one thing that I need you guys to repeat after me. When I say opportunity, you guys will say nation. So, Michael, are you ready? Let's do this. I'll meet you in a minute. All right, let's go.